And now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello, and welcome to another episode of And Now for Something Completely Machinima. I'm joined by Tracy Howard. Hello. And Phil Rice. Hey there. Uh, Ricky is still enjoying his uh, summer vacation <laughs> at the horror convention. <laughs> I was trying to think of something funny nice there, way it just of saying kind of slipped it. my mind it's just horrible but, um yeah uh so i hope you uh, having a great time um but here we are we're going to be discussing the news uh, of things related to machinima and related technologies um so tracy what have you got for us this week oh another bag load of stuff um game news let me start with some of that so for the last few months, I've been looking forward to seeing something stunning that celebrates World of Warcraft's 20th birthday. But I've honestly found nothing at all that I want to share with you. Uh, and then I saw that someone had created a, a, a World of Warcraft 2.0 in Unreal Engine. So I thought, here we go. This is the thing that I can share. And I have to say, it looked really stunning. There are a few kind of comments videos on it as well. But the next thing I know, this thing has been um, a copyright strike from Blizzard. Um, so, yeah, there's still wow. no nothing really to share with you that celebrates WoW's <laughs> creative community contribution to the world of uh, Machinima. So please, somebody, if you are listening, do share some interesting machinima with us. Um, because after four months of looking, I'm getting desperate with it. Nothing. I think that Blizzard would want to do something because 20 years is a big milestone. It is. You think they'd want to celebrate that and let the fans celebrate that. Yeah, I am very disappointed, I have to say. All round, I'm very disappointed. There's loads of kind of speculative, you know, this is what the next iteration of it could be and all that sort of stuff. But it's done with AI and it's not, it's nothing to do with machinima in the way right. that we've always understood it. I mean, if Olibeth was still around, it would be just up his street to present something in, in the, the way that he used to create those beautiful um, videos, but sadly he isn't. Anyway, please somebody share something that's of relevance and interest for the, the, the WOW Machinima community in particular. I'm desperate. Anyway, in other news, I was kind of intrigued to see that some game developers are now releasing music albums um, from the games. It's it's kind of long been, I think, fairly interesting fact that none have done that really before. Uh, I know you're going to contradict me on that, Phil. Um, but I actually thought, you know, it's not uncommon to hear folks attempting to play um, some of the more I iconic pieces, but, but you know, as orchestral pieces and what have you. Um, anyway, the particular one that I picked up on this month was um, from Classic RuneScape um, with a Battle Axes and Ballads album that's been released by Jagex Laced Records and Regen Audio. Now, Laced have also released a soundtrack album from Metal Gear Solid, uh, also from Resident Evil and from Tekken 8. And Square Enix apparently has released a 175-track version of the Final Fantasy VII Rebirth soundtrack earlier this year as both a digital download and a limited edition CD box set. Um, yeah, quite quite interesting. I think this is particularly interesting, though, with this kind of activity. I wonder what the thinking is for how these soundscapes can be used in machinima now, because um, just scrape bits of 
audio, which is what you tend to see being used in 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 filmmaking, possibly is you know this is this is possibly not going to be something that you're going to be able to do when when they've taken the trouble to actually release it as an album. And as we all know, kind of um, you know music IP protection has always been considered in a, a little um, different way to the way gameplay assets have tended to be um, viewed by developers. So I suspect what you've got going on here is maybe a bit of a sideswipe at the community of machinima creators, an attempt to kind of stop them in their tracks, perhaps, or maybe just another way that the developers are thinking of how they might uh, make money from content creators um, because maybe what you've got is kind of like, uh, you know, uh, market saturation in terms of the sale of the game itself. Anyway, I welcome thoughts on where folks think um, this one might be going as well. Um, Phil, did you want to come in on that as well? Because I think you've got some other observations on Doom, did you say? Well, uh, w <coughs> when you mentioned the uh, the old school RuneScape soundtrack, it, it, it reminded me of a uh, it was a user-led project it wasn't something endorsed by oh. its software but basically a uh a user-led project to take the the music of the original doom games from its software and release those with with modern instrumentation the, the original doom music was mostly delivered in the game as as just general midi files that would you know, just just play uh, because that was efficient. It was very small sp file size, um, and and also the composer of that music, Bobby Prince, uh, basically was very cooperative with letting people do things with his soundtrack stuff. There's actually I've got a personal example of that. Actually, there's a song on the album that I put out recently that is built on a chord progression from one of his Doom soundtrack selections. And I contacted him way back, like in the year 2000, I want to say, and said, I love this piece that you composed for Doom. I'd like to build a song on it. I've got, I'm hearing a melody, got a lyric idea. I want to build a song. Would you be interested in, you know, some kind of a either a derivative work or uh, even, you know, going in as co-writers on it. And his response to the email with the same day, very nice man. He said, that's not even a song what I made. It's just a chord progression. You're welcome to do whatever you like with it. You don't need to credit me. You don't need to do anything. It was amazing. And apparently that's that was his his attitude about that stuff. He was a very, very unselfish human being. Uh, he sadly passed away in 2007, but he was old. He was quite old. So, uh, but anyway, it made me think of that project where uh, in the early 2000s, uh, a bunch of users came together with kind of modern electronic and, and you know, a lot of the, a lot of the MIDI music from music was technically heavy metal per chord progressions, but played through MIDI, it sounded, you know, like video game music. It didn't sound like metal. Um, and uh, so, the, yeah, they, they, they did that project um, I think that the you hit on something, Tracy, with why would why would the developers themselves do this? First of all, indie developers have been releasing their soundtracks through Steam as like bonus content for years. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's it's a very common thing to happen for indie games um, that they'll just they'll release the soundtrack through Steam and you can play it through there, but. Maybe the reason they do it, and definitely the reason the big companies would do it, is that's the easiest way to get your music into YouTube's content ID system, which is the thing that can identify it in other videos. Um, that's just the easiest way to get that done. To manually register music is is cumbersome. But if you just release it as an album, your music distributor will take care of that for you automatically. Mm. Um, so that's... That's the that would be the reason why they're doing it now. The positive to that is that music that's in the YouTube content ID system usually means that if you use it in your video and it's detected, 
then there will be if if your video is monetized then there will be a shared monetization applied to that video so it's not a copyright strike it doesn't get you banned from youtube uh, instead you if you if the vid, if you have monetization if you're a, a partner channel then you won't be able to be the only one making money off of the ad revenue on that video um, usually it's a split a shared situation and i think it's proportional to the amount of the song that's used um and so that's yeah in terms of revenue stream for the developers that's that's a logical reason for them to do it. I have no reason, to, I have no way to know that that's why, mm. but that is how it works. Now, if there is still some music that if you use it, it will be a legit copyright strike. And that's just, that's that's the, the risk of using someone else's music. But usually you can tell that the best way to approach it is if you're going to use music you know is copyrighted, then upload your video as unlisted don't publish it or make it public or anything at first upload it as unlisted and even if the there's a copyright detection process that happens right after the upload and if there's an option where where you can uh where you can can choose to be notified once they've finished the copyright check if it doesn't complete immediately and then they'll notify you of the copyright status and what the consequences will be and such like that before you actually publish it. And that's a way to test the waters on that without actually getting a damaging copyright strike. Mm. So, yeah, it's 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 weird because it it has become easier for owners of copyrighted music to regulate and make revenue off of the use of their music um in cooperation with youtube and i guess that's a i guess that's a positive thing uh and it means that actual copyright strikes like the damaging kind are far less frequent now it's more of a you've used this music so you know you're going to share any revenue you make with the music owner or youtube actually just released a tool that i plan on testing uh, and making a video showing the results um, that will use AI to remove just the offending music from your video while preserving other audio. How 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 well it works? I'm not sure yet. I'm going to find out, and I'll I'll share the results here. But mm. yeah, it's, it's because the current system is it'll just remove all of the audio from that section, which means yes, if you've got some dialogue, that goes too. Yeah. So it makes your video. You, it's an option. If you've just done a music video, but you can't replace it easily. So you have to yep. go back to your editor and put in some different music and upload it again. Yes. Which is obviously the, the easier solution than trying to mess around with the YouTube things or just have a suddenly your video goes silent. Yeah. But I just got a notification this week that they've rolled out that feature and uh, they're inviting people to test it out. So I'm going to actually test it with some known copyright music just in an unlisted scenario. And just yeah. see what it can do, and then I'll I'll re I'll report back on that. But yeah, that's that's most likely the reason, Tracy, that they're releasing them as albums, is because the distributors have all these channels already set up to inject that music into the copyright ID, uh, the uh, content ID listings at YouTube, mm. and it's a, it's a way to make revenue. And with and honestly, it's a way to it makes it easier for music publishers to establish a friendly relationship with people who would use their music. Now, someone who is who really wants to make every cent of revenue off their videos might still find that oppressive, but you are using someone else's stuff. So mm -hmm. if you want to make all your revenue, use original music. Yeah. That's yeah. the solution. I wonder don't even use don't even use free music. Like there's there's stuff on the free music archive, for example, FMA. Don't even use that because someone could put something on the free music archive and then two years later change their mind and put it into content ID. That happens to that site that I used to use for years and was part of called Film Music IO. Mm -hmm. If you guys remember that. Yeah. And uh, the owner of that, Sasha, ended up basically shutting that site down. And the only music artist on there now is him because one of his biggest 
one of the biggest composers that was participating in that site decided to, after putting all their music catalog out there through his site as Creative Commons, decided to change the licensing and upload it to Content ID on YouTube. Mm. And so his site was getting all these inquiries about copyright strikes is the term people use, but it's the shared revenue thing. Um, and it just infuriated him. And he just says, I, I don't have time to do this. I'm not running a, mm. you know, I'm not a copyright lawyer. I don't have time to do this. I just want to make music. But he had to shut the whole thing down to, to get out of that. So the point of that is that, you know, someone who releases music, they can change their license. And YouTube isn't going to, mm. YouTube doesn't have the facility to be able to negotiate through that. If you go, well, at the time that I used the music, it was creative comp. There's no way to, you can't really convey that kind of subtlety very easily through the appeal system. Mm. So the easiest solution is just, be more either original. Accept, use AI. Either, yeah, use original music. AI music I'd be cautious about because uh, it, it's it was probably trained on other samples. Exactly right. Yeah. Be. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and frankly, all of those have very confiscatory uh terms and terms and conditions. If you if you read the fine print on those, music you create, it's not yours. It's not yours. It's yours to use in the way that they see fit right now. But long term, no, it's all theirs. So be real careful about AI music. Um, so yeah, the, the the free and clear way is work with an original composer and and you know build build a library of music with that, and then you can use that. But or use it through a legitimate licensing service like Epidemic Sound or Artlist IO or one of those reputable places that you're paying for it but there's there's no there's no free route for that stuff unless you just befriend a composer there are composers out there who will do that and not charge a thing they just love making music so you just got to find somebody like that there's a so. composer called um, i think his name is scott buckley mm -hmm. i think that's, that's yeah his name. is he, he still did, active yeah um he, he composes music um very good music and it's all Creative Commons, free to use. He insists on, um, you have to put a special thing in uh, to credit him and he's got a special way to format it. Right. Um, but that's it. And he's got a donation uh, button. So if you do use his music, uh, you can donate to him, which of course you should do because he's put mm -hmm. this out for free. And, you know, I've used his music a couple of times in uh, some videos and, you know, it's really good music. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of music you'd expect to pay good money to be able to use but he just absolutely for free sasha and is another one the guy who runs the the website is still filmmusic.io all of his music hundreds of compositions uh, of various genres and really good quality all creative commons free to use on youtube you can buy an extended license to be able to use it even further but the default license is credit in the way that he asks and you can use it it's amazing and he's really 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 good it's very this young german composer he's fantastic like every style you can think of he's done so yeah there's good there's resources like that you just got to look for them so yeah. we're thinking here then with this particular move we're going to see a lot more games devs putting on the uh the music and the the soundscapes of their wouldn't surprise me. Mm. There was a Interesting. Thing about I guess the key one, hang on, I just, I'm just thinking, extrapolating from that kind of conversation and Phil's comments there, maybe the key ones that they're actually aiming at then wouldn't necessarily be the machinima creators, but the Let's Players, who are ones that have many more millions of followers primarily. Sure. Because they're just, you know, playing the game and the content is just going there. I mean, honestly, it makes logical sense, too, because mm. it's so cheap to put an album out and distribute. I think with like CD Baby is one, DistroKid is another, under $20 and you can publish an album and they'll take care of all that stuff. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. 20 okay. bucks for a composite, for a compilation of music that's, you know, many, many songs. It's mm. not expensive to do. That's really good news for people who want to produce their own music, but 
it also, I mean, everybody's going to be able to use that. So yeah, it makes total sense for them to do that. It costs them nothing virtually. And then the only potential uh, outcome for them would be some revenue. So why wouldn't they? Yeah. So yeah, I think that is. And I think, yeah, the, the juicier the target, the more audience, then that's obviously more revenue. So mm -hmm. sorry, David, you were going to say. I was going to say about 15 years ago, there was a thing that came. Video games would usually include the soundtrack as a special feature on the disc, and Mass Effect comes to mind uh, specifically. And so, when the DLC for Mass Effect was released, they would actually release an, uh, a, an album of the music they'd composed for it. But this was before the content ID system on YouTube existed. So, I think that was just for profit and because a lot sure. of fans liked the music and they wanted it. And then that seemed to stop. But now it seems to be coming back. And obviously, the, the, this conversation is well yeah physical media is dead essentially so yeah why yeah. would they do that quake quake did that quake was the first game i know of that the actual game one of the discs that came with it was intended to be put in the drive while you played and it was the yeah. soundtrack and so they yeah. could have this cd quality music without it being taking up space on the drive and it's and it's you know trent reznor did the soundtrack for you know the nine inch nails guy did the soundtrack for quake one it was fantastic they did the same thing with quake two it was a disc. This time they hired a, a composer that's much cheaper than Trent Reznor, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember the I can't remember the guy's name. He was a young guy, but he did a great soundtrack for Quake Two. It's much beloved. So yeah, that used that was the trend uh, in the late '90s and and early 2000s. And yeah, then physical media started to go away. Mm. So yeah, they they found a way to do it. And you know, why not? I mean, I mean, if the game's got good music, you're going to want to listen to it when you're not playing. So, right. Well, yes, and, and evidently many will, I suppose. Anyway, so that that actually was a really interesting um, a discussion. It went in a direction I wasn't really anticipating. So it's really good to get your input on that. That possibly related, actually. I've got another kind of thing that I picked up on, um, which I also um, shared with you um, in the in the in the thing that we used to sort of share content before we kind of come on the podcast. This one is about the debate that's going on around game uh, destruction and consumer rights. Now, um, it's it's being um, spearheaded, this, this is a campaign being spearheaded by Accursed a Farms. And basically what's being argued here is that what happens when games are taken down after copies have been sold to players with very little warning, what happens to the game copy that you have? Can you still legally play it and so forth? Um, and apparently there's arguments on both sides. No, you can't. No, you shouldn't. No, it's no longer supported to, well, you bought it, didn't you? Is it a good or is it a service kind of argument? Um and I, there isn't really a good answer to this, it would seem. Um, in, in the legal systems around the world, they haven't really thought this one through very well. Um, it kind of actually relates to the point that games have lives long after they've been closed down. They're, you know, if it's, if it's software, once a game has closed down, then it's often software and there are campaign groups um, that exist which will argue that actually as orphan software shouldn't that just be given to the community that's that's a thing that's a you know that's a group of folks that are making that argument um now a curse farms is sort of arguing for greater clarity on the rights of game players under the legal systems around the world um I don't think this is ever going to be that clear cut, though, um, because, you know, from some of the responses he seems to be getting, they're basically kind of pushing back to him and saying, oh, yeah, you need to sort that out in the country where the publisher is 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 located. So they're kind of almost absolving responsibility at a kind of, um, you know, national level to sort of more local levels. Um I, and I, you know, I was kind of thinking, well, actually, this is kind of an interesting legal side of things, uh, which could also be extrapolated to the way in which um, content uh, um, using those very same games 
is also um you know accessible long before long after the game has kind of um closed down um and we've always sort of you know looked at things in the moment in terms of you know you know fair use custom and practice and all of that kind of stuff where where the content as the the um a creator might put out is kind of protected under that kind of kind of system um but if if this legal process goes the way these guys want it to i think it will have ramifications for machinima um not not least because this content can be used and reused and reused again multiple different times in multiple different ways long after a game has um been uh you know been taken out of the market altogether so they're arguing for for some sort of uh update to t's and c's which basically say how long a game is available for um if they did that that would immediately put a life on how long a transformative piece could also be um available i think um but although it's you know i think it's not very clear so i think there are ramifications from what's being discussed here i'm no kind of legal brain on this sort of thing but i definitely think it's worth thinking about the life cycle of games not just as something that is played but as something that is used in alternative ways and kind of where i'm going with that as well is because on another one of the projects that i've been involved in we're talking about heritage content and the heritage content from games and the the archiving of old games old machines such that future generations have the opportunity to experience those games in typically museum um and arts organization kind of context which is another set of use of the the, the games themselves none of which seems to be figuring in any of the kind of discussions that um this uh, community and uh, spearheaded by a curse farm seem to be looking at so i think there needs to be a sort of a slightly wider uh take on what's being discussed here to include the breadth of the way these things are being thought about um i just throw that out throw it out there really because i'm sure other folks have got an opinion on it um i'll share the video that you can have a look at um, because this clearly has been going on a little while it's obviously popped out of something that they've experience themselves um like i said i don't think there's any immediate answers on it but i think it's just one of those things that we probably need to be watching in terms of the potential maybe unintended consequences on the likes of the machinima creator community it seems so, crazy on the surface to me it does like the the notion that to me i, I don't see any on the surface i don't see any difference between the stance that a game can no longer be played once it's been closed to me that's is, is that any different than if a book goes out of print you can no longer read it yeah that's right what it doesn't make any sense i don't i don't know i can't think of any well he's on he's kind of taking legal it. parallel you know there isn't a legal pa parallel to it but he's kind of uh you know analogized it to an author coming into your home and saying right i have that's my book i can burn that you're no right. longer allowed to keep it on your shelves. right yeah same same concept there yeah it just that, that seems nuts now the thing is too is i can't help but wonder if there's more under the surface of this possibly than, than it might appear because i think there's a possibility that the people who are raising this issue and pushing back against it what they would really like is for there to be something that makes an abandoned game free fall into the freeware domain mm -hmm. fall yeah. into the public domain and that is something that developers would push back against if for no other reason then history has shown us that games once thought dead can sometimes get 
re-released through you know, there's these platforms like uh galaxy of games i think it's called or gog good that all games. of a sudden yeah that you can play the original roller coaster tycoon which i don't think will even run on modern computers it needs like windows 98 or something but but they've got an emulator where you can then purchase that game and run it again yeah and if, you, only, if you had the disc you wouldn't be able to do that you know they only unless you games. still have an old computer they only release games if there's a way to play them on modern computers. They'll spend if they get a license for it, they will spend ages finding a way to make that work. And if they can't, yeah. they won't release it. Yeah. 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 So and because there's that possibility, you know, even games, I mean, it, as as unlikely as it seems, there's so many games from like the 1980s that were done on Commodore 64, for example, or something that you know, there's just not really any way for most people to play those. I mean, I purchased hundreds of dollars of games in that decade mm -hmm. that I can't play now. But I, but that's not because they prohibit me from doing so. It's that they're just the the hardware and software is obsolete. Like that operating system yeah. without an emulator, you can't even. And even if I had the emulator, you have to be able to get it off the. I don't even have the physical media anymore. There's all kinds of yeah. things and in the way of it. Even if you had the actual hardware. You have to find a screen to connect it to, and of course the connections are different now. So yeah, you, you, you need one of their screens. Yeah. yeah, and there's people who have that, uh, but it's rare. It's really, really rare. But the the notion that you know there's some who would say, well, okay, that's the situation. So that whole library of games should just be free to the public because you can go download an emulator for any old system. I'm talking from the box arcade mm -hmm. units all the way up every home game system ever made every old pc ever made there's an emulator and you can run it and then you can go download the game for free yeah well i mean that's that's a paradise for somebody who just wants to be able to just confiscate these old games but you figure a company like oh i don't know infocom that that company's been out of business for decades yeah but they made this whole string of games that essentially are interactive novels why would they give up the rights to those forever because i mean those games were re-released on Steam not too long ago uh, through an emulator, but it was legal and you had to purchase it again, but it was cheap. And so, yeah, there's, there's, I can, I can see why uh, developers don't like the idea of that these properties become abandoned, uh, that these properties become freeware just because they're no longer in active development. But I don't think it's just oh, I bought it in the past, so I should still be able to play it. I, I, I think that's a that's a non-issue. I don't think there's any chance that there would be a law that would get passed that prohibits someone from playing the old thing. It's This is really about what's the solution to that. And the, the solution I, I would bet behind the scenes being pushed for is this stuff should just become free. It should oh, just fall into public domain. I, I have absolutely no doubt that's, that's the case. Yeah. And that but, that raises different issues, you know. I think so. so yeah, I think that's it's one to watch for sure. It's the, um, it, it is. It's a very interesting um, debate, which I just feel is a kind of very um, one dimensional at the moment. But I think it has to be richer than what it is because of all the unintended consequences around yeah. what's being proposed. I think right. Well, then you factor in the 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 reason you brought it up, which is mm. okay. So. Mm. If if the if the rights related to that game have some dramatic legal shift, then what does that do to the rights of content created with that Absolutely. game? Yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was thinking. Yeah, um, I was thinking. I don't get it either because there's nothing to actually stop me from. I've got over here a shelf with various PC games on it, and some of them are available on Steam and uh, GOG and so on. Some are not available, and um, part of it is because they're licensed games, and the legal process of releasing those again is such a nightmare. It's just not worth it. But I could take the disc off, put it in my computer, and play it again. And you know, those companies can't do anything about it. The only thing I can think of is online games where the servers shut down. That's yeah. a different category. Well, that's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's different. Yeah. That game was technically a service all along. Yeah, mm -hmm. a game that that's reliant on the online hardware. That I have, I, I don't see any issue with. But you're right, Damien. First of all, apart from even just the absurdity of the rights thing of 
trying to tell Damien you can't do what you just described. How would they enforce something like that anyway? Yeah. Or ne- even know that I'm doing it. Right. Yeah. It's totally, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little absurd. In the same way, I mean, the book analogy works. You know, I've got some book that was published in the 1960s and it's been out of print for 40 years and what? So now I can't read it. And, and if I do, how are you even going to know I do? Yeah, yeah, of course. Unless I read it out loud into my Amazon Alexa. Oh, so that the so that the NSA knows that I'm reading it, then <laughs> you know. So, uh, know. but we're now getting into the realms of the human brain, computer well, the other, interface design. Well, the other thing I'm going to finish off with is there were a lot of games since, so again, twenty to fifteen, fifteen to twenty years ago, where they have a single player campaign and then multiplayer, but the multiplayer would use GameSpy, mm-hmm. and there would be no direct IP connection, so you have to use right. the, the online service that's provided. It's free, but you still have to use it. GameSpy doesn't exist anymore. Right. So all the games that have that built-in service. Yeah, there were like a, wasn't it some kind of peer-to-peer thing uh, similar to Napster except legal? Yeah. That's what GameSky was built on. I remember that. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the multiplayer for those games no longer works and there's nothing you can do about it. Except, well, there's some other apps you can get to simulate the um, IPX connection and stuff like that, but that's really finicky and it doesn't always work that well. Now right. there, was a, there was a Star Wars game called uh, um, Empire at War. It's this real-time strategy game like Command mm-hmm. and Conquer. I remember that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That used GameSpy. So when that disappeared, the servers disappeared. So you can't play it online anymore. Um, about 10 years after GameSpy disappeared, it was released on Steam and the original developers had updated the game to use the Steam servers so multiplayer worked again. Wow. And That's kind of cool. There was another Star Wars game. Um, I think it was one of the Battlefront games. They did the same thing with that as well. So people could play it again because you know they'd gone for a long time without being able to. And I think that, having that option open is good as well. Sure. But, mm. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. I'll keep you updated on, on that. Or if you spot anything, please do Super. share it with us as well. Um, okay, so on generative AIs, I'm going to just put a few things on on the blog, a um, few links of things that I found that were reasonably interesting um, that you may or may not be in- interested in. The thing that I wanted to just touch on is Eleven Labs Voice Cleaner. Have you have you come across this, guys? This mm-hmm. removes unwanted background noises and enables you to isolate voices. Now, I thought this might be quite useful for us. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has, wants to have a little go for that uh, at that um yeah that's so, another one i plan on testing i have not tested it yet okay. but um yeah no, noise reduction generally is uh it's challenging to get good results that are mm-hmm. so I, i'm i'm I, i've been impressed with their their uh, efforts generally uh 11 labs they're really they seem to impressive. be the, the the top one don't they really oh yeah, yeah. absolutely and then on the music side, um, I saw Suno's contest winners were being promoted. Um, and one winner um, had a really interesting track. I mean, it, it's really very listenable. It's called Maybe. I'll put a link to it, see what you think of it. Um, I think what's quite interesting is for the for the winners, they put something like a million dollars aside to pay out or the, these kind of um, co-created, um, you know, prizes for these co-created works. This the guy that had made this particular one got a ten thousand payout as the as the prize for his work, which I think is is brilliant. I've just been looking at him on uh, on X Twitter. He's got virtually no followers, but his music's been downloaded nearly a million times on uh-huh. Suno, which I think is really interesting. Um, so good good luck with that. I think that's that's a yeah. fascinating thing. And then Phil, you've got something that you wanted to share with us on the on um Vimeo's updated AI policy as well, I think. Yeah. So we talked a few episodes back about the the changes to uh, YouTube's interface to reflect the changes in their policy about how they're, you know, at this point, how they're going to identify or how, how creators are going to kind of self-declare on whether or not AI content was used. Um, and, 
you know, we had we had quite a quite a discussion about that. Well, Vimeo has updated their uh, policy in terms of the, the title of the article was how do I label my videos to indicate they contain AI generated content. Um, so like we like we discussed on the uh, uh, on a video this month about uh, is is this the the pro, the digital creator pronouns thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but but essentially that's it. How do you it's 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 it, what's interesting about it is it means that they can't it means something we already knew, which is that they can't detect when AI content is used because they're asking people to self-declare, right? Mm -hmm. So that's interesting in and of itself. I don't know that that will always be the case. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think detection is, is in our future for sure. Um, but essentially, in a nutshell, their policy is not all that different from, from YouTube's. Um, they're, they're, they're vague or open to interpretation by using certain terms that really don't aren't don't have agreed upon definitions in the context of AI. So they say, well, you know, thing does something look realistic? Does something look lifelike? Those things can be fudged. You know, I mean, that, it, that's opinion. It's subjective. So I, I, it's it's essentially the same policy maybe a little bit more clearly articulated but still relying on self-identification of the usage and also mm -hmm. these these very subjective terms about you know the, the the notion behind it is supposed to be you're not supposed to use you're not allowed to use ai without declaring it if you're going to deep fake essentially mm -hmm. i mean that's the term that does not seem to appear anywhere in either of their content policies but that's what they're worried about clearly is deep fake the deep fake phenomenon creating something that didn't happen and deceiving people right but they can't see neither one of them can seem to figure out how to pin down what that is and so they leave it very open and broad and essentially the the policies are just they're not really actionable unless you just like putting your ai pronouns on your film and and saying and declaring like like the creator did this month unless you just like doing that um as you know, under the under the guise of like taking a stance or something but in terms of usefulness or effectiveness or policeableness yeah it's there's nothing there's nothing enforceable here really you know no, but maybe yet. what maybe what they're doing is getting us to tag a training set <laughs> right that is possible yeah <laughs> that is possible which and it's also alarming because yeah. crowdsourced you're uh, crowdsourced exactly <laughs> uh, uh, do, do you mean to tell me that there's not going to be any dishonesty in the self-labeling thing so yeah it's 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 a mess it's a hot mess um nobody really knows what to, we, we've said this before on, on episodes here nobody really knows what to do about this thing you know yeah. and it's happening it's it's evolving into something so fast and uh you know policy is there's just no way for policy to keep up with this at this point so they're doing the best they can i think these policies tend to be you know they're more of a cover their ass objective than anything else um, but th they know that if this does go bad legally, that they could potentially be on the hook because they're going to be the biggest targets to sue. So they have to try and cover their butts. But nobody really knows how to do that yet. It's it's mm -hmm. it's it's a bit of a mess. But, you know, anyway, so, yeah, that's that's what happened with Vimeo recently. So really interesting real time challenge that we're facing with it, I think. Almost yeah. in real time evolution is fascinating. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I've got a couple of other things. If you can bear with me, um, sure. One is uh, I saw that Louis Andrade had put a how to video up for that stunning work that we shared with you in episode 130 called Firefly, um, which was that music video he directed for Esoterica, made in Unreal Engine. 
it's a really interesting how to video. It's not your standard, well, I did this and then I did that. It's done in such a beautifully poetic way. It's definitely worth watching it because, my God, I've seen so many how to videos now. I just loved what he'd done with this one. Um, cool. So I'll put a link to that. Um, I found a few Unreal Engine things I'd like to share as well. One being to a set of dynamic lenses that you can kind of download from the marketplace and play with. Now, these don't require blueprints. They, um, they're they own, as I understand it, only lens objects that can be applied to any cine camera and they work interactively within the Unreal game engine, all of which sounded really fascinating. I'm guessing they're, they, they maybe put like filters on somehow. I don't know. I'm not really too sure quite how virtual lenses i'm not quite sure how those work either yeah mm -hmm. um anyway it, the, the the guy that's created these is a professional special effects uh filmmaker uh, uh his name's andy davis and i'll put a link up on those as well and then there is a kind of a more traditional lip uh, sync limp sync i was gonna say limp sync tutorial about live portrait in comfy ui for those that are looking to figure out how to do lip syncing images and videos with ease. Um, so there's another one that I'll share with you. And then I want to just sort of close out from my comments um, this month on uh, something which I found particularly interesting in the context of how content distribution channels, channels may um, become more expanded. And these are comments made by a guy called Harmony Corin, who's a filmmaker, he stated that um, the film marketplace, especially in the US, is very narrow, which we kind of all know. If you only consider box office, the box office as a metric for, for success from an exhibition standpoint, you're cutting off other ways to think outside the box. If you don't continually reinforce this idea that movies and media can travel and exist across different frameworks, then people default to only the one mode. Right now, Younger audiences don't want their options limited. Now, why that is so important? I mean, for many years, we have been saying and highlighting what a broken distribution system there is for content creation, such as Machinima, um, with the only real viable option being YouTube. Because let's face it, Vimeo's there, but it's not really viable if you want an audience. It's just for hosting your content in many ways. And that would be true also of all the glam organizations, the galleries, the, um, you know, the arts organizations, museums and whatnot, through which and film festivals, through which a lot of other types of content is actually distributed as well. But it never makes it in anything other than the, this kind of one typical Hollywood way. Um, so, well, my, my view here is that if more directors and filmmakers across the spectrum are prepared to come out and say that there needs to be more emphasis on distribution channels, then one would assume eventually we will get a marketplace, um, you know, actually responding to that request. Um, and like I said, I keep trying to highlight this. I think it's imperative that somebody starts to take on board that we need more than YouTube for supporting the distribution of the kinds of content that we're looking at here we're just we're in a monopolistic situation with youtube and it's it's wholly unsatisfactory in my opinion um so yeah just wanted to sort of close out on that really um i would like to see many more ask these um kinds of questions particularly those in the, in the hollywood set um i think it's long overdue in my opinion um so there you go that's my thoughts for the month um, I hope you've enjoyed some of the points. Um, Damien, I think you've got a few things you wanted to share as well. Yeah, uh, I've got a few fun ones and uh, and then a serious one. I'll do the fun ones first because I imagine the serious one will generate some discussion. Um, so first off, there's a game called Deep Rock Galactic. And it's, it's a one to four player game where you play as a space dwarf and you take on various missions uh, working as a team on randomly generated maps uh, and you have to mine minerals and survive random attacks by alien bugs. And it's a great co-op fun game to play. 
and they've released a rock and roll well it's a heavy metal <laughs> song it's called rock and stone which is the phrase that comes up a lot in the game and it's an italian band who have done it they dressed up as dwarves uh they don't dress up as dwarves from the game they're wearing more the medieval fantasy kind of like you'd expect in tolkien uh but they're, they're you know they're they're singing about the game basically and i thought this went nicely with your discussion a little bit earlier in this episode about music and from games um it's a great song and it's fun to watch even if you've never played the game it's just it's just kind of fun so i wanted to bring that up because you know you don't see that kind of thing happen very often they don't actually use footage from the game in the music video oh. but that doesn't matter it's still a case of a game has inspired this song and it's been licensed officially by the company so i thought that was quite fun um the next one is a big update for no man's sky this is a game we've covered many times um we've seen many videos created with it and this update overhauls the graphics engine of the game and reworks how worlds are generated so they're now they're much more detailed water looks more realistic there's more plant life and aliens look better um uh, there, there's just a whole load of updates to make the game more modern because it, okay it's not that old of a game but they want to keep it up to date and they're working on another game which the name of it has escaped me right now but they want to move some of that technology into no man's sky as well so that no man's sky players could you know, benefit from that which that's a very rare thing because usually whether they're developing for the next game gets does it make it back to the previous one that they worked on um i've not had a chance to try it out yet when i added it to the list they had just released the, the trailer to say it's coming but it was actually released a few days ago so when you listen to this you can give it a try if you want and if you're going to use this game for machinima you're going to find that your videos look a lot better than if you were working on this just a few weeks ago so i thought that was quite good and the next one it's a similar thing for the microsoft flight simulator um i don't know we don't really get that much machinima made with that but they released the content pack and it's not it's a, a an update to the the way the many cities in the uk are rendered now my understanding is they actually flew helicopters and planes over these cities to capture all the buildings and roads and landmarks and everything in as much detail as possible uh so i did fly over um there's, there's, i can't remember how many cities are updated in this but the three cities i know very well so i flew over them to see just how accurate they were so bristol which is near me i went down really low and i could see primark and it actually has it written on the side of the building oh that's how accurate it is Ooh. now some of the, there's, a, there's this big um statue thing at, on the outside it not, nothing to do with the shop it's just there that didn't get captured so well it's, it looks kind of weird but the actual buildings they look great and if you live in one of these cities i imagine you could find your house and it would look like your house uh so i don't know if that's useful for any mission creators out there but you know if, if that's the kind of detail you want in something you're working on give us a try and this is update 17 and there are many other world updates for different parts of the world that have done this very similar thing to it um so you know if the uk maybe not of interest to you in your project but maybe one of these other areas is uh give it a try i know that brazil is the next one that's coming up but they're still in the process of analyzing all this data they've captured so i don't know i imagine that's quite a time consuming thing so i don't know how long that's going to take but i believe that is the next one mm, i'd be very surprised if the brand owners it's like you said you saw Primark there. I'd be very surprised if they weren't straight on to that asking for some kind of uh, either takedown or recompense right. yeah. for being represented in that way. We've seen that happen before with something well, else that, that, that's kind of, I can't, I, I think it was something somebody recreated in Minecraft, which was a kind of a yeah. representation, but there was a, a major claim against them from a brand owner who said you can't put that in there it even looks like our building take it out or we'll sue yeah uh, so i don't know how microsoft are going to get around with this because i flew over 
I mean, you, I don't think you're really meant to fly this low and see these details, but I did it because I was really curious. And I recognize many shops in exactly the place they are. Yeah. And yeah. they're very easily identifiable by the, the names outside. Wow. Um, uh, but, you know, mm -hmm. you have to get in really, you're almost touching the rooftops to be able to see it, and you're probably going to crash. <laughs> I mean, I did crash when I was trying to find Primark, but uh, that's the kind of detail that they captured. And I, I was quite impressed by that. But you're right, there are going to be companies out there who are not happy. Yeah. That, and somewhere like Primark, which is all over the country, they're going to have to go through each of those cities and find every single branch of Primark or <laughs> some of these other shops, which are much more um, like Tesco's or any of those supermarkets where you, you can go into a city and there's probably about 50 of them, even just the little ones. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how well, that's, that's going to be a lot to get. There's rid of. a difference between what this is and what Google Earth does, yeah. Yeah, because they actually have to fly over um, the city to capture the data from above, but they must have done it at a street level as well, because otherwise you wouldn't get Primark written mm. on the side because it'd be very distorted. Mm. So I don't fully understand the technology of how they did it, but it was pretty accurate. Mm. Yeah, you know, I can't help but wonder. You know, there is Google Earth and even, I mean, Google Maps, which kind of references Google Earth at times. And, yeah. you know, the street view cars capturing things. Uh, Microsoft actually led the way on that before Google took the lead. But back back in the day, Microsoft had something where they were, as, they were assembling satellite photos of the entire Earth. Hmm. That seems like a nothing thing now, but like somebody had to do that for the first time right and it was this impressive thing they called it the terra server i believe mm -hmm. and yeah they were basically hey we're photographing the whole world again that seemed this is 25 years ago or 30 years ago even 25 yeah 25 years ago but to me now that's like i've got a f app on my phone that i can do that right but at the time it was a big deal how do we capture all those where do we store them all how do we make them available so this this gathering of this visual information about geography and architecture has been going on for decades by big big companies the biggest of companies they must have there must be something that enables them legally to do that and avoid you know, individual corporations from saying we don't want ourselves on there, you know, like which which might be true if what you've got is a public service like a map. But now what you're talking about is a game. Yeah. Hmm. Well, think? yeah, that's the, the but that's the thing is Microsoft Flight Simulator. Real pilots use it to train. So like what when is it application software and when is it a game? That's it's it's question. all about how you use it, you know, but I just, I can't help but wonder like, you know, Microsoft's not stupid. So mm -hmm. they wouldn't have been going and ga gathering all this without having crossed all their T's and dotting all their I's legally. So yeah, this will be interesting to see how this happens because mm -hmm. it just doesn't make sense that, you know, if, if your objective is an accurate, detailed scale model of the earth you've probably thought about you know if randy's plumbing says that they want to opt out they probably can't you know i mean i guess google or uh north korea opts out of google earth don't they to some degree like there's there's parts of the globe yeah that you can't see in the level of detail that we see but how much of that is that nation getting what they want and how much of it is just that they're refusing to cooperate? Mm -hmm. So there's no Google Street View cameras, you know, driving around Pyongyang. So we don't have that detail there. But, you know, it goes down my street or your street. So I don't know. It's that's that's interesting stuff, but it just seems. Yeah, I, I it wouldn't surprise me if, if Microsoft and Google both have. Someone has signed something somewhere right in all these endless terms and conditions we all accept when we launch things. That basically, w those rights have been signed over to these corporations. They can, they can po photograph whatever they want, and not be in the same kind of trouble that, like I would be, if I, as an independent filmmaker, went downtown and filmed something in front of the Chrysler Building or something. 
uh, mm. Chrysler could come after me, right? But I don't know. It seems like Google and Microsoft, they probably are probably not terribly worried about that, but I wonder why. So, yeah. yeah. There's an element of, if you're, if you're doing uh, a film shoot in, you maybe could be start on this. Let's say you're filming in New York and you see all the, you got a shot, you, you're able to get a shot of the cityscape behind you. And obviously people own every single, or people or companies own all the buildings you're going to see. Mm. How do you even contact them to say, well, I'm making a film and your building is in the background. You can't really see it that well, but it's over there. And what are you going to do? Complain about it? Or what about if you're a tourist and you take a you know, you go up on the Empire State Building, you take a picture of the city and then you post your pictures on, you know, Facebook or Instagram, whatever. And, you know, those buildings are out there. Well, you're not going to edit them out because the owners of them might not be happy about that. Um, so I wonder if it comes into something like that as well. Yeah, no. it can get, I think it can easily get very complicated. We've even seen this uh, in Second Life. We right? have, yeah. Yeah, where, where th there is a kind of a rights holder stake that the owner of a build on there can potentially have over even having their their sim be photographed. Yeah. Which has like always just blown my mind. Like hmm. yeah, but but that's true. And I think when someone when someone gets a film permit, there's probably that's probably something that's factored in. There's a lot of bureaucracy behind it, you know. So hmm. but yeah, how to how to individual What's the legality on individual buildings? Does it is it every single building has that right, or is it only ones that have been determined to have almost a trademark look to it? You know, hmm. um, that that's that's a great question, and I don't think I I want to know. I don't want, I don't either. And in fact, I don't I've just decided I'm not going to enter filmmaking now. Yeah, is that is that is that a Ricky question? Because he might know that. That may be a Ricky question. Yeah. But We'll have to yeah. ask you when he comes back. On the other hand, maybe we shouldn't be giving lawyers ideas about no. how to I know, exploit right? things yeah. even further. All right, so no, but, uh, but but it was really just a very interesting point yeah. as to why they would be doing that. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, you know, you can now generate cities procedurally even in such an amazing level of detail in something like Unreal Engine. Why would you bother to do this? For well, a game. With a flight well, simulator. It's a flight simulator. That's yeah. right. <laughs> well, it's, it, people well, play you, it as on, a are game. You, are you simulating actually flying or what you're looking at on the ground? Oh, you're but, simulating flying. But you want to it's, fly it's, in real places. It's highly accurate. There are real pilots who set themselves up with quite a rig with the panel and everything. To I mean, it's 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 reputable in that regard. So... Realism is is a plus. Okay. You know, now going down to the street level, yeah, why? But I guess it's it's one of those. Well, because we can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I tried to. I found my village in the, this simulator, and it did not get included in the updates. So, what that looks like is you got the satellite photos. And I can see my house as a texture, but they've also placed a house building on top, which looks nothing like my house. <laughs> in right. fact, none of like I I. I can recognize my neighbor's cars and things like that and say, oh, I know who that car yeah. belongs to because it's just a colored blob on the texture. But there's no actual car there. Um, yeah, Google Google Earth evolved in the same way. Yeah. When Google Earth first started to go 3D, it was by default, there were models that were either tapped on by some kind of algorithm or attempted to be extrapolated from the satellite imagery. But then they encouraged people. Remember Google SketchUp? Yeah. Google SketchUp was developed primarily for that purpose, encouraging people, hey, go 3D model your area, your city, your building. And then they would. there was an approval process where they could submit it for inclusion. This happened over a period of decades. And slowly but surely, it gets filled out. So... Yeah, these things took a long time and a lot of of human hours put in creating them, but they crowdsourced a lot of it at the beginning. And I'm sure Microsoft approached it the same way. And as they get more, now there's more technology that can actually lift 3D out of photos and stuff. 
uh, they don't have to do that anymore. But that's how it started. Yeah, and so yeah, you end the- up with these weird things where we get at the right zoom level. It's like some absurd looking geometric yeah. smudge instead of your actual house. Yeah, that's the way it was. Oh, well, like, it, you know, I, I might be is. somebody planning a terrorist attack on one of these cities. Let's use one of these things. Then. Right. Well, I'm glad to live in a village where the, it's not entirely accurate. I mean, it's if from <laughs> above, the roads are all in the right place. The where the houses are, they are they do look like houses, just not the actual houses. And there's the correct number of them up the streets. You know, I, I stopped and counted. But you know, if you're wanting the actual my actual house to see it in the game all you're going to get is a smudge on the which you can see under sort of bleeding out around the edge of the 3d house that's sticking out yeah um but yeah when i went to bristol in the game and it's just they got the clifton suspension bridge to the valley and they got a suspension bridge across the top that is perfect you can fly under it and everything previously it would probably be a generic bridge and you'd see the suspension bridge as a texture going down the valley and up the other side, painted on. Uh, because there are lots of things like that in London as well. In, by the Excel Center, there's a, a huge hotel. It's actually a boat. Previously, that was a boat-shaped texture on the ground, and the water was actually above it, so it looked like it sunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now the actual hotel build boat is there, and it is. I checked the photos. It's the exact boat that they have, and it's highly detailed, so... They had to get that somewhere. Mm. Yeah. Lots of dodginess with this one, I think. Yeah. I still got one last thing, which I thought was the serious one would generate a lot of discussion, but they've just had that with the flight simulator. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, last year, the there was a, an actor strike with uh, lots of actors going on strike against uh, Hollywood studios and um, TV shows and actors and movies so a lot of things got held up they've gone back on strike and this time it's about video games so lots of video game voice actors uh are now on strike uh sag after uh, uh leading it again uh this time it's about uh big uh publishers using generative ai to uh create voices and not compensating the voice actors who provided the original samples and mm. um I think it's fair that you know these voice actors should not be replaced that that, that, that's what they're there for but so if you are going to use their samples to generate content for your games you should pay them fairly pay them fairly for it um because otherwise they're going to find other jobs and then you'll have no voice actors to get any samples from um so i don't obviously this has only just started i don't know how long it's going to take or i imagine it's going to be quite a while and it's going to hold up um games that are in that sort of mid-level development where they haven't got the re- dialogue re- fully recorded yet. Um, is there anything that's going to be released, you know, between now and Christmas, that's probably fine because everything's going to be recorded and finished or close enough that they'll just go with it. But um, this is obviously going to hold up games and affect the, the gaming industry for quite a while. Uh, hopefully there will be a quick resolution for that. But as we saw last year, it took them quite a while to come to a solution that they were happy with and i was actually thought that this was covered in the deal that was settled last year but uh, i think we need ricky here to discuss yeah. that mm. that's really right. interesting because if you remember uh, must be a couple of years ago now we were talking about ricky's evil uh, what was the name of his character that he played the henry the red henry the red that's it being ripped off from the film and put into a new game without ricky even being consulted and it's ricky acting that character it looks like him it moves like him it talks like him and he's not been uh included any in any of the royalties in in the yeah. process of turning it from film to game and i was really annoyed about that not because they've done that but they had a, a voice actor to voice the character well, like why don't ricky. They ask ricky first yeah if he says no, then fine, find someone else to do it. But give him a chance to do it because they did get some of the other actors from those films to voice their characters who had been given the same treatment. So, you know, ask Ricky to do it. And it's up to him if he wants to do it or not. But when we talked to him, he hadn't been asked. Right. Yeah. Difficult. Yeah. It's a messy industry, that. Yeah. So uh, we'll keep an eye on this one and uh, 
and see where it goes. But uh, if you're looking forward to any games coming next year from any of the big studios, uh, maybe. Oh be no! Patient. Is that GTA Six like? GTA Six. Oh. They tend to have a little bit of voice acting in their games, don't they? Oh, just a tad. Actually, GTA Six has a special clause in their voice actors that they're exempt from this uh, strike, which the actors' union is not happy about. But there's nothing they can do about it right now, so it's not. Are you serious? To... Really? Yeah, I don't know wow. the details of it, but um, it's not going to affect wow. GTA Six. Savvy move by Rockstar there. Wow, yeah. savvy move. Yeah, I I hope that this is an easier one to. To me, this seems like. Maybe it's just because it's so specific and so narrow uh, a situation. This should be, in theory, easier to negotiate terms on than hmm. the, the overall, the larger issue around the first strike was very complex, hmm. you know, because there was a lot of different kind of moving parts to it and, and a lot of different types of media. And this, it just seems like there's... It's a matter of agreeing to uh, a rate that they can agree upon, that the, that the actors can agree upon, and that the developers can agree upon. Of Because I don't think the developers are going to say, well, we just, okay, we won't use AI at all. It's, it's, it's too good a technology to, for them to ignore. Mm -hmm. it's, it's got huge advantages, but it shouldn't be free and at the expense of the actors, right? Yeah. There right. should be yeah. something. But that's really the only... To me, that seems like the only major point of negotiation here is what rate is fair. Yeah. You know, with reasonable people, that should be resolvable in an afternoon. But of course, it's <laughs> never, it's never, we've got to a, never quite we've, that simple, right? So we've got to a strike. So they can't be that reasonable because obviously they've right. been negotiating it for a while. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you know, I, I mean, let's, let's face it, probably the reason that the actors were forced to do that is because these big companies are greedy. I mean, I, and and that's just that's the nature of human beings, you know, so it's not as big an indictment as it might sound. But, hey, you got to be fair here and you you can't, you know, you can't kill the goose yeah. that lays the golden egg here. The, the voice actors are hugely important for these games. So, yeah, again, if if there's rational people involved. They're going to recognize that, and it's a matter of just deciding on a price tag for it, which could be a real win for the actors in the long run. Like if they could come up with a rate they agree to, how awesome is it to get paid essentially a royalty to not do any more work? Yeah. And for the developers, it's a big win because I think the biggest value of, you know, let's just use Eleven Labs Tech as a, as an example. You've hired an actor for a, a role in a game and you need a handful more lines from them delivered in the same tone, delivered in the same level of speech and everything as the original for some kind of expansion pack. Well, bringing that, you know, arranging to bring that same actor in who might be quite busy uh, and then hoping that they'll be able to achieve the exact same output as opposed to what 11 labs could do with a nice rich set of samples i mean that's just a that's an efficiency thing that is it's hard to resist you know so but the key is the actor shouldn't be shafted there they should be they should be paid something for that because it wouldn't be possible without them yeah so i think i, I don't know i'm optimistic that this will be something that's not terribly difficult to to find an agreement on and hopefully it's sooner than later because yeah i mean if, if it's something like up. updating the the gameplay in a way that the original recorded dialogue no longer makes sense like uh, a tutorial sure and, you know you got a character narrating the tutorial and you've changed the keyboard layout so rather than getting them in just to repeat a few lines then do that but if it's going to be a, a big thing then definitely get the original actor back because right you know, if they're a major character and they've got a lot of new dialogue, get them back. It's worth getting them to do the proper performance. Yeah. And, you know, just a couple of lines here and there. Well, that's what I think the that... actors probably would object to the most is the idea of, let's call it the worst case scenarios for what developers would do, which is they're going to hire an actor 
they're going to get enough voice samples from them to build out a profile that they can then generate unlimited dialogue of whatever they want mm -hmm. for the rest of their lives. Yeah. yeah. That's awful. Yeah. Awful. You know, that can't be allowed. It's it's just wrong. Like it's clearly, obviously, morally wrong. You know, that's what the actors are going to be pushing back against. That's probably what would the developers would think is the best case scenario. Let's just mm -hmm. build a stable of actors. In yeah. one year of recordings, we could be set for life. No, and looking can't at work the that list way. Of, yeah, but looking at the list of publishers that they're striking against, you can feel that the people in charge of those companies are thinking, yeah, let's save some money. And yeah. 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 Now, one benefit uh, that would be lost from AI use of a voice actor is a lot of these games, the higher end games, they're doing face capture at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Using technology like what uh, James Martin does with uh, with iClone and, and what and what James Cameron does with, you know, <laughs> Avatar is they're they're capturing the voice performance at the same time they're capturing the face. And you don't you'd lose that if you went with AI reproduction. So um, but. You know, for games that maybe don't emphasize that as much or think they can fudge it. Um, yeah, they, they, they try to save that money. So, again, hopefully they that reason prevails here and they come up with something that's fair compensation for that. Cause I don't think the tech is going anywhere. It's a brilliant innovation to be able to clone a voice is brilliant. It's, it's fantastic, but, but you can't exploit somebody when you do it. No, it needs to be used responsibly. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think that's all of our news this month. Unless anyone else has got anything you want to discuss. All right. So uh, thank you for uh, listening. Uh, we've covered a lot of different subjects here, and AI has obviously come up uh, quite a few times, as it always does. It's a technology that um, we keep a close eye on. And so, yeah, if you've got anything you want to talk about with AI or any the other things we discussed in the news, um, please let us know at talk at completemachinima.com. Uh, we look forward to your feedback, and we will see you all next week. So uh, from me, David Valentine, from my co-hosts, uh, Phil Rice and Tracy Harwood, Bye. Uh, we'll see you again. Bye. Bye-bye.